Well, good morning. Glad to have you with us as we uh, are in week five of our message series through the book of Hacks. Happy Father's Day to uh, all the dads out there and for all of you. Uh, if you have missed out on any of the messages in the series, I know it's vacation time. want to encourage you to go to our website, newlife247.com, and messages or media and, and get to our YouTube channel. You can catch up there. It's definitely worth your while. Have you ever had a really bad customer service experience? Or maybe had a company deal with you uh, in a dishonest way? Most of us can come up with not just one example, but multiple examples. How many times, right? And uh, one that came to my mind as I was thinking about this, last year, last winter, winter of 2017, we have propane for our heat and for our, uh, our, wa our hot water. And company came out, filled up our tank, like 350 gallons of propane. And it just so happened, my mom and dad live next door, totally different company. Next week, I was over there talking to them, and I said, just out of curiosity, how much did you pay for your last load of propane? They told me, like, wow. Mine was a dollar more per gallon than what they paid. On a 350-gallon tank, that adds up quickly. So I was determined. When fall rolls around, when this is gone, new company. I'm done with them. Before I even got that opportunity, it got on later in the year, I received a bill in the mail for $50. Called the propane company and said, why in the world am I getting this bill? And they said, unless you use a certain amount of propane every year, we charge you a tank rental fee. You haven't used enough propane. What's the limit? Well, you've got to use at least 200 gallons. I said, if I were you, I would go back and look at your records. When was the last purchase I made? What was it? Well, about six months ago, you ordered 350 gallons. Oh, okay, you should not have received that bill. We'll take care of it. We'll take it off. Okay, great. While I've got you on the phone, just out of curiosity, what is your current rate per gallon? And they told me. It had actually gone up a little bit. So it was more than a dollar a gallon more than what my parents were, were paying. Next day, I called their propane company, said, please come out. I want to change service. Dissatisfied with my current service and what they're charging. Before they could even come out and, and, and look at what we needed. I got home from work one afternoon and my daughter Mia said, hey dad, did you order propane? Uh-uh. Truck came this afternoon, <laughs> filled it up. I called the company. I didn't order any propane. Yes, you did. You called us last week and when we told you that there was a service charge unless you ordered X number of gallons, you said, uh, to go ahead and fill up the tank for whatever it took so that you didn't have to pay the service charge. No, I did not. Whatever you need to do, you go back and look at your records, go back and listen to the recording of the phone call. I don't care. But the bottom line is this. I didn't order it. I'm not paying for it. You can come out and pick up the gas and the tank. And so they did. We, we changed. They had, we went through a process. I mean, they didn't want to lose a customer. Well, Mr. Sasser, what about if we knock 50 cents a gallon off of, uh, off of it? No, thanks. Somebody else comes on the phone. Well, Mr. Sasser, I'll tell you what. We will meet the original company's, or the com competing company's price. I don't care. Why? Because you have been dishonest with me for the last time. You've overcharged me. You've taken advantage of me. It seems to me like you really don't want my business. We have these experiences with companies, and it seems like, are you trying to do everything possible to drive me away? You really don't want my business. What do we do? It's not worth the hassle. If you're like me, when you have a bad experience, you take your business elsewhere. Maybe somebody else will treat you a little bit better. If you do research on why people do not go to church, why people have left churches, why people uh, don't want to hear what Christians have to say about God, the majority of the reasons center around this idea that either a Christian specifically or the church in general has done something to offend me. They've made me angry. They haven't treated me well. And so I left. 
it doesn't matter if their, uh, what they tell you is true. It doesn't matter if it's a valid criticism or not. It doesn't even matter if that's the reason that they left the church. We still need to be aware of the attitudes of people and understand we don't want to make it difficult for people to come and hear the gospel. We don't want to make it difficult. We don't want to drive people away by behavior. We don't want to make it difficult for people to come to faith. Last week, Pastor Brandon was in Acts chapter 10, preached a message on how to be a people person. God had given a vision to Peter. Uh, the vision revolved around his idea of the worth and value of people and discrimination. And, and through that, Peter uh, was sent out to go to the house of Cornelius, a, a Roman centurion. So he was a Gentile, someone that Peter previously would not have gone to see because he was not Jewish. And to go and to meet and to go into Cornelius' house, that would have made Peter unclean. So Peter's beginning to see people the way God sees people. So he went and he met with Cornelius. And as he shared the message of the gospel, the Holy Spirit fell. People gave their life to Christ. The door was opened for the Gentile world, for all the nations to receive the good news. And so the believers began to go out and tell other Gentiles about the message of Jesus. The church in Antioch sent Paul and Barnabas out on the first missionary journey. So more and more Gentiles are turning to faith. This week we hit Acts chapter 15. That's where we're at. As, they, as the Gentiles respond to the gospel, some, some men come down from Judea. They were Jewish men. As the men came down, they proceeded to tell the new believers, you cannot be saved unless you're circumcised. Uh-oh. That's not what I heard. That's not the message that was preached. That's not what I signed up for. That's not what I agreed to. That what is the truth. So what were they going to do about it? Peter, uh, Paul, Barnabas, some other believers from Antioch, they went up to Jerusalem and so they sat down together to discuss salvation. People are asking, what do we need to be, do to be saved? What is required for salvation? We need to figure this out. We need to have the correct message and we need to be united in the message. At the end of the debate, James, Jesus' brother, stands up. He makes this statement, Acts chapter 15, verse 19. Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God. Don't place any unnecessary obstacles in the way of those turning to God. In other words, don't make it difficult. People are literally being persecuted and dying for their faith. The only hope of the world is Jesus. The only way to know God is through faith in Christ. Don't make it difficult for those people to turn for salvation. So that's our key verse this morning. It led me to my title, How to Make It Difficult for New Believers. That's not what we want to do. We want to make it simple but if we were to you know, decide to make it difficult, these are a few of the things that would definitely do it. Number one, when we have criteria that's confusing, we make it difficult for new believers. I've looked up several timelines trying to get an idea. How much time has passed from Acts chapter 1 when Jesus ascended to Acts chapter 10 where the gospel went out to the Gentiles, to Acts chapter 15, where we are today, how much time had passed. The consensus is, Peter went to the Roman centurion approximately five years after Jesus ascended. Acts chapter 15, the Jerusalem council, the consensus is 10 years after that. So we're looking at 15 years have, have passed since Jesus ascended. What started as 120 believers in Acts chapter 1, day of Pentecost, 3,000 believed. A couple chapters later, it said the number of believers grew to 5,000. After that, they quit putting down numbers. They simply said that the Lord added 
to their number day by day, or a great many believed. There was no church growth strategy. There was no new believers class. There was no discovery class, no new members class. People simply went out, told people through the power of the Holy Spirit what God was doing in their lives. People got saved. Church exploded. How many people were there at the time? I don't know. Could be upwards of, you know, 100,000 or more. I don't know. But daily, over 15 years, they were multiplying. It didn't take long, especially once the gospel went to the Gentiles, for people to ask, what do we need to do about salvation? What about those people? What do they need? What do they need to do in order to be saved? Acts chapter 15, verses 1 and 5. That's where we pick it up. Some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. A couple verses later, verse 5. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, it's necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. Once people start adding to the criteria for salvation, where does it stop? To be saved, you need to place your faith in Jesus. That was the message Peter preached at Pentecost. Then some believers came down and said, you've got to be circumcised. Then the Pharisees rose up and said, no, you've got to be circumcised and you've got to keep all the law. Essentially, you've got to become a Jew, and once you're a Jew, you're acceptable, and then you can be saved. That's not the message. Can you imagine the confusion? Not only was there no new believers class, there was nothing written down. At best, it was another 15 years before the first gospel was written. Possibly, if we look at and take the earliest date for when the book of James was written, some of the believers may have heard or read the message of James, but that's it. Nothing else. No New Testament. All they have is word of mouth, people coming and telling them what to believe. So can you imagine the confusion? That's why the meeting in Jerusalem was so important. Salvation is key. We've got to know and understand and agree on it. So they discussed it. They didn't just come up with their opinion. They went back and they gave examples. They looked at the Hebrew Scripture, to us the Old Testament. What did it say about the Messiah who was to come? They talked about and they shared their experiences. Peter talked about the coming of the Holy Spirit on the Gentiles just the way, the same way the Holy Spirit came upon the Jews at Pentecost. Same Holy Spirit. Salvation has to be attained the same way. And so they were in agreement. The only thing required for salvation is by grace, through faith in Jesus. We might think that it has to be simpler for us today. After all, we've had 2,000 years uh, of history with the Bible, the entirety of it. We know exactly what it says. How could we possibly make this complicated? Multiple passages of Scripture, I just want to reference one, Romans chapter 10, verse 9, says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. What's complicated about that? Jesus is Lord. Possibly the, one of the earliest confessions of faith. Not just Jesus is Master, but literally, Jesus is God. Confessing with the mouth. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus, the Son of Nazareth, is the one true God. Believing in your heart, the center of your very being, that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved an inner transformation through belief leading to an outward profession of faith. How could that be confusing? As the song Dylan and the worship team sang, it's a simple gospel. But it's a supernatural event. 
it's impossible for me to wrap my human, human mind around exactly how God raises men from the dead. I don't know how he did it. I have faith that he did it. He's God. I trust that. I don't have to understand all of that. I simply have to have faith that he did it. So when we go and we start sharing our story with others, and it's difficult to understand and comprehend a supernatural act of God, we start adding things to our story. They may be good things. I can't tell you how many times. You may have heard others you know, do the same. I can't tell you how many times I've had conversations with people. Have you committed your life to Christ? Well, in 1977, I walked the aisle and had a conversation with the preacher. Great. I didn't do that. Can I still be saved? I, did, I didn't go have a conversation with the preacher. Is it possible that I've been saved? I was baptized. That's the number one answer. I was baptized at, su- at, su- at a certain point. Great. Was that by immersion? Were you sprinkled? Perhaps you grew up in the Catholic Church. Were you baptized as an infant? Does it matter? I haven't been baptized. Can I be saved? It starts to get confusing. I joined the church. What kind of church? Baptist, Presbyterian, Lutheran, Anglican, non-denominational? Does the kind of church that you join matter? Can I be saved if I joined a different church? kind of church than you did. Is that possible? I prayed a prayer. What'd you pray? Can you point to me in in the Bible and tell me where the words of that prayer are that saved you? All of these can be a part of your story. Those are all good things. But guess what? Not a single one of those things ever saved you. Jesus' death on a cross and your belief in that, your faith in that, your trust in that, that's what saved you. You can do that and not be baptized. It's the first step of obedience. You should be, but you can do it without being baptized. You can do it without being a member of a, a, member of a church, without being on their roll, but you should be in a church even if you haven't formally gone and gone through some kind of membership process. You want to be a part of a group of believers but that didn't save you. We've got to be clear, not confusing. What is it that's involved in salvation? You can't explain away the supernatural. Don't have time to go through the entire passage this morning, but take a minute and read it next week. Uh, John chapter 3, the story of Nicodemus. Nicodemus goes to Jesus in the night, and he says, I know... Rabbi, that you are a teacher from God. If you weren't from God, you couldn't do the signs that you do. But he calls him teacher. I know that you are a teacher. Jesus' answer says, it's, you cannot see the kingdom of God uh, unless you've been born again. Nicodemus says, how does that even make sense? I'm an old man. Can I go back inside my mother's womb and be born again? Jesus says, no, Nicodemus. Unless you are born of water and the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Nicodemus asked Jesus, how can this be? In other words, that doesn't make sense. It's a supernatural act of God. This is the message of 1 Corinthians chapter 1 where it says the message is folly or foolishness. It doesn't make sense. Chapter 1, verses 21 through 23. For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. You can't know enough. The demons know who Jesus is. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe, those who have faith. For Jews demand signs, Greeks seek wisdom, But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews, folly to the Gentiles. That's the message, no more, no less. 
death, burial, resurrection of Jesus. For the Jew, a stumbling block. Literally, the trigger of a trap. Scandalon. Something that produces a behavior that leads to ruin. The Jews could not believe that Jesus was the Messiah because to them, to their belief, to all that they knew, a man hung on the cross was uh, condemned. So they could not believe it. The disbelief led to death, ruination. He was cursed. Couldn't happen. To the Gentiles, that's nonsense. It's foolishness. You don't crucify, you don't hang gods on a cross. Criminals are hung on a cross. That man could not be God. He could not be who he says he is. But it's the only criteria, the message of the cross. Don't make it confusing and start adding in other things. The cross and Jesus' death, sinless life, the only one able to be an atonement for our sins. That's the message of salvation. If you want to make it difficult for new believers, make the criteria confusing. Number two, if you want to make it difficult, have conduct that is contradictory. I guarantee it comes as no surprise to most of you that you have either thought or heard Christians referred to as hypocrites. You may have thought the same thing yourself somewhere along the line. The dictionary defines a hypocrite as a person who pretends to have virtues, moral or religious beliefs, principles, etc., that he or she does not actually possess, especially a person whose actions belie stated beliefs. In other, in other words, that's a person whose conduct is contradictory to what they say they believe. There came a point in time where even Paul called out the apostle Peter. He called him a hypocrite. The story is related in the book of Galatians, but the actions, the event actually takes place somewhere between the conversion of Cornelius in chapter 10 and the uh, council of Jerusalem in, in chapter 15. Peter had gone down uh, as the gospel continued to spread in Antioch, and the Gentiles and Jews were both coming to faith, and they were having meals together. If you remember from last week's message, as I mentioned earlier, the Jews would not eat with the Gentiles, did not want to. Peter had to see that he could do that because the Jews believed that they would become unclean by doing that. But here, through the gospel, Gentiles, Jews coming together, they're having meals together. Peter goes down. Peter's eating with them. No problem. But then, it says some representative of James came down, and Peter separated himself from all the others. Why? Because he feared the circumcision party. He feared people uh, that would call him out for eating with the Gentiles. And so he separated himself. Others followed. Once Peter moved, removed himself, others followed. It said even Barnabas was led astray by Peter's hypocrisy. So in Galatians chapter 2, verse 14, it says, When I, that's Paul, saw their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel... I said to Cephas before them all, If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? When our conduct is not in line with the gospel, we lead others astray. We make it difficult for those that are far from God to come and experience faith in Christ. That's the point where you start hearing people say things such as, well, you're all a bunch of hypocrites. It may be very tempting to, be, to make a flippant or sarcastic comeback. Well, why don't you come join us? One more is not going to hurt, right? You may have heard somebody say that. Somebody use that. But it's not helpful. All that's going to do is push people farther away. If our goal is to reach others, we've got to recognize this. What are we going to do about it? I don't know if you're familiar with Josh McDowell, but he's a famous uh, evangelist, apologist, author. He made this statement. Christianity does not stand or fall on the way Christians have acted throughout history, 
or are acting today. Christianity stands or falls on the person of Jesus, and Jesus is not a hypocrite. The truth of the gospel does not depend on the behavior of other believers. My salvation does not depend on your behavior. Your salvation does not depend on my behavior. Our salvation depends on nothing more and nothing less than the completed work of Christ on the cross. Jesus wasn't a hypocrite. What are we going to do then? Paul wrote this to the believers in Philippi. Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Your manner of life, the Greek phrase literally is, live or behave as a good citizen. That would have caught the attention of the Philippians. That was a big deal. They placed great pride and value in their citizenship in Rome. Why? Not everyone was a Roman citizen. It came with certain rights. You know, they were able to not pay certain taxes. They could, they could own land. It was a privilege to be a Roman citizen. So Paul is reminding them, you have all of these privileges, but guess what? As a citizen, as a citizen of Rome, you have certain obligations as well. As citizens of heaven, we have certain obligations as well. How valuable is your salvation? What does it mean to you? How important is it? Has it made a difference in your life? It's not easy. Well, you just don't know how hard it is, how evil it is, where I work, where I live, everything going on in the world. It's difficult. It's much easier to give in. Do you think that it was any easier for believers in the early church that were being persecuted and killed, living in Greek society where every, everybody you know, did what they wanted to do? It was no more evil today than it is, was then. It's no different. It's not easy. Why fight it? Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter addressed his audience as aliens and strangers. He reminded them they were people dwelling in a foreign country. Not just Rome. They were dwelling in a foreign country. As believers, our home is in heaven. Our eternity is in heaven. The believers were separated we're separated currently, temporarily, from our home. We need to keep that in mind, that this place is not our eternity. Verses 11 and 12, he said, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. Why? So that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on, the God on the day of visitation. Keep your conduct honorable. It doesn't matter what others say about you. It doesn't matter how others treat you. Keep your conduct honorable. In all circumstances. It's like I tell my children all the time. The only person you're responsible for is you. I don't care what the other children at school did. I don't care what the other people uh, in the band did. I care about you. I don't care what the teacher did. You are responsible for you. Keep your conduct honorable. Why? Someone else's eternity may well depend on your witness. How would others glorify God? How would people far from God glorify God on the day of visitation? Through your witness when you are treated less than honorably, when you continue to stand for God, others may begin to wonder, what's different about you? You may have opportunities to share the gospel with someone else. They may repent and believe, and then they too can glorify God. It's important. We don't want to make it difficult for people to come to know 
God, because the days are evil. It's the only hope. If you want to make it difficult, have criteria that is confusing, have conduct that is contradictory. Number three, have a culture that is careless. One of the complaints I read about from non-believers, I hadn't really thought about this, but it makes sense. Comments about Christians said that Christians are bad at friendships. What do they mean by that? It means we go out and we target individuals as projects. We target individuals with a desire to convert them. We can target individuals with a desire for them to make a decision, but we don't really care about the individual or person. We don't form relationships with them. We don't take the time to know them. Relationships take time. Anybody ever been a part of a messy relationship? Every last one of us, guaranteed. Relationships are messy. They take time. You can't build a relationship uh, seeing somebody for 30 minutes once a week. We can't build relationships even within the church just on Sunday mornings. We've got to care about people. The old saying is true. People don't care how much or what you know until they know how much you care. Jesus made this statement. John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. A new commandment I give to you, that you will love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. By this, by your love for one another, by this, all people will know you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Started thinking, the disciples already knew the two greatest commandments. Love God with all your heart, with all your soul and all your mind. Love your neighbor with yourself. That doesn't seem to be a new commandment. Look in the difference in the wording. It doesn't say, love your neighbor as yourself. It says, love one another, your neighbor, just as I have loved you. That's a divine love. That's a sacrificial love. That's a demonstrated love, not an emotion. That's how the world is going to know that we are followers of Jesus. Keep that in mind then as I read Acts chapter 15, verses 20 and 21. Remember back to verse 19, James had said the Jews should not trouble or make it difficult for those that are coming to uh, know God. He concludes the declaration with this, starting in verse 20, but we should write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from what has been strangled and from blood, For from ancient generations, Moses has in every city those who proclaim him, for he is read every Sabbath in the synagogues. You may be tempted to think, that sounds a lot like he's adding something to it. Sounds a lot like he's adding more trouble to the Gentile believers. But consider the context. Here in America, for the most part, we've kind of lost sight of this idea of table fellowship, of coming together in groups of friends and family and sharing a meal and spending time getting to know one another. We're all about the food and get on to the next thing. We're so busy, myself included. But if you go to Europe, you'll find the exact opposite if you've ever been there. You'll notice that meals take a lot longer because the priority isn't on the food. The priority is on the people, on the time together. Much the same way in the ancient world. They spent time. Read Acts chapter 2 through chapter 4. They're going from house to house together. They're spending time in fellowship. They're sharing meals together. What do you think happens then in the early church when you get a big group of Jews and a big group of Gentiles together who have differing beliefs on cleanliness and food laws, and everything else. You put them together, they're going to have problems. And if it's not handled correctly, you're going to push people away. You're going to make it difficult. If the Gentiles were going to serve meats that had been sacrificed to idols, if the Gentiles were going to serve meats that hadn't had the blood properly drained from them, there were still Jews that kept Torah. Not because they had to, 
but because it's all they ever known. From the very earliest days, Moses was preached in all the synagogues. It was all they would known their entire life. It was still offensive to go someplace where people were eating meat sacrificed to idols. So they would stay away. They would simply not partake. They, lo- they would lose opportunity to reach Jews that were far from God. What were they going to do about it? If you've ever been in a long-term relationship, you know that for the sake of the relationship, for the sake of unity, sometimes you need to make concessions. Each side needs to give a little bit. Concessions don't mean compromise. You can make concessions without compromising the truth of the gospel. You can make concessions without compromising biblical principles. You've got to know the difference. This was one of those times. The Jews, if the Jews would concede that the Gentiles did not have to be circumcised, they did not have to keep all the law, if the Jews would move a little bit closer to the Gentiles, and then if the Gentiles would go, okay, I can eat this meat, I can do these things, but to honor my brothers, I'm going to choose not to. If we'll move a little bit closer to the center, a little bit closer to the Jewish position, guess what? They could all have fellowship. They could agree to come together in unity. They could set aside some things that, if the, if the Jews were going to set aside some things that did not have to be done, and the Gentiles were going to set aside some things that they, they could do without, they could come together for fellowship, for the sake of community. What are the preferences that divide us today? Because that's great. The knowledge that it divided them then is great. But what what are we going to do with it today? Alcohol. Can Christians drink alcohol? You're over 21? Absolutely. There's not a place in the Bible where it says, you shall not drink. Now, should you? There's places throughout Scripture that talk about the dangers of it. You can look around in the world and see the dangers of alcohol. So should you? Personal position, I have never, ever, ever once in my life said, thank you, God, if I hadn't had a couple of beers, that wouldn't have happened. (laughs) Know, Know what I'm saying? I've never said that. In my life, the opposite is true. I can look back, and the things in my life that I have the most regret over, where the things were most difficult in my life, I can say, if I hadn't had alcohol, if it hadn't have been a part of that, that wouldn't have happened. So for me, I choose not to. I don't drink. My choice, my preference. Now, we go across the street, we go to tailgaters, we're going to have lunch together. You decide to order a drink with your meal. I am not going to scold you and leave. Why not? That's your preference, not mine. What good is it going to do me to scold you and leave? All that's going to do is bring division between the two of us over something that's a preference. It's not going to accomplish anything. If I go over to your house and you've got, you know, a a couple beers with your dinner, I'm not going to say a word. Your preference. I'm not going to have a drink with you, but that's my preference. You come over to my house, I would prefer that you leave your alcohol at home. My preference. But we're not going to divide over it. The problem is... Certain churches, certain Christians, certain people, they, take, they pick a side and they turn their preference into law. That causes division. When what each side should do is exactly what Scripture does. In order to do our best to not offend our brother or sister, to put our brother or sister ahead of ourselves, to humble ourselves and go, you know what, that is a preference, but for the sake of unity, I'm going to give my preference up. That's what we should do. But we got to know the difference between preferences and prohibitions. The other thing mentioned in there was sexual immorality. I, I prefer spicy food. My daughter Mia, the exact same way. My wife Anita, my son Jeremy, they don't like spicy food. I cook. Most of the time, the food is less spicy than I would like it. It's more spicy than they would like it, but that's a preference. We, we meet in the middle for, so that we can all eat together. Now, if one of my children come home and they say, Dad, is it okay for me to have sex with my girlfriend or my boyfriend? 
What do you think I'm going to say? No, that's not right. That goes against a biblical principle. That's not a preference. That's a prohibition. we got to know the difference. What are some other things that we choose to uh, turn convictions into law? Dress codes at church. Ours here is simple. We require everyone to come in dressed with things covered. That's where it ends. Wear some clothes. But that's our preference. There's nothing wrong if you choose to wear a suit or if you choose to wear shorts. You go someplace else, you've been a part of a church, perhaps they had a different dress code, unwritten. You followed it or you didn't follow it. We're not going to divide over that. It's a preference. It's foolish to get upset about the way that people need to dress for church. Tattoos. Can a Christian get a tattoo? Well, in Leviticus talking to uh, the, the ancient Israelites when the nations all around them were getting their bodies marked up with tattoos to honor and worship foreign gods, God said, don't be like them. Don't do that. Today, I've got tattoos. None of them are in worship or honor for a pagan god. It's a preference. You want one? Get one. My son said, Dad, can I have a tattoo? Your choice. Uh, if, if you're going to do it, my recommendation would be that you have it done well because you're going to live with it. But that's where it ends. It's not going to cause division. Bible translations. Which one should I read? The one that you're going to read. Go out and pick one. There's so many available. I'm not going to argue with you over which one. If you come in with the New World Translation from the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Book of Mormon, we may have a different issue. But if you come in with, with, with a standard translation of the Bible, whichever one that you're going to read, you can take truth from that. Read one. Politics. Don't get me started. There's not enough time in the day. People have taken their uh, convictions and turned it into a political argument. God is not a Republican or a Democrat. You can have friends that disagree with you politically for the sake of unity. You can have conversations, even if you don't like someone or their political views. You can't push them away. The gospel's that important. Salvation is that important. Don't let silly things divide us. There's enough division in the world. There's enough hate in the world. Why do we have to fight over things that don't matter? If you leave here this morning... And you start thinking, well, the pastor said that I can drink and I can have tattoos. Yes! Y'all, you've missed the point. Right? People want to know that we care about them. There's too much division. People celebrate. You've seen it in recent weeks. People celebrate when other Christians, when other leaders fall. Lord, help us when we're celebrating someone else's moral failure. Are you helping to create a community, foster a community that cares for people? Or do you just want everybody to look the same? Because that's what the Jews were doing. They wanted everybody outwardly to look the same. They lost sight of the inward transformation for the sake of outward conformity. Let's not put obstacles in the way to make it more difficult. I watched this movie this weekend. I can only imagine. Some of you have probably seen it. Uh, tough movie to watch on Father's Day weekend. Guys, you need to watch it. Doesn't matter if you like. It, it tells the story of, Mer of Mercy Me's lead singer, and he, he wrote, uh, I can only imagine. It tells the story of, of his life. It doesn't matter if you like their music or not. That's not what it's about. He said through this movie of his dad, my dad was a monster. Imagine that as a child thinking that your father is a monster. Imagine that as a dad, your child thinking that you're a monster. And through his battle with cancer, I'm giving away parts of the movie now, Still a good movie. You should still go watch it. His dad comes to faith in Jesus. 
And at the end of the movie, there's a, there's a clip from uh, the National Prayer Breakfast that went on last year in 2017. Mercy Me was invited to be a part of the prayer breakfast. And so I, wanted, I couldn't understand all of what he was saying. And so I went back and I watched that clip of the National Prayer Breakfast so that I got it right. He said of his dad, I saw Jesus change him from a monster to a man desperately and passionately in love with Jesus. And I thought, if the gospel can transform that dude, he can change anybody. And so he was passionate about the gospel. Why? Because he had seen what it had done in the lives of his dad. There are similar stories in this room. There are lives in here, including mine, I know for a fact, that but for the love of Jesus, we were an entirely different person. The world needs those stories. The world needs Jesus, not division. What are we going to do about it? Let's not put stumbling blocks and obstacles in the way of the message. How do you need to respond this morning? You may have realized somewhere along the way that you put your hope for salvation in something other than Jesus. I am not, my purpose is not to make you doubt your salvation. The Bible says you can know, you can know with surety that you've placed your faith in Jesus, that you will spend eternity with him. I'm not trying to get you to doubt that. But there may be another event that you've marked off and you've said, well, I was saved because I prayed a prayer. I was saved when I joined a church. Any of these other things. You may realize this morning that's you and you have yet to commit your life to Christ. Do that today. Do that today. With heads bowed, eyes closed. You may want to do exactly what I did 11 years ago. I didn't know what to pray. I cried out, God save me. That was it. Over and over and over again. God save me. God save me. God save me. Didn't know how to pray anything differently. Wound up in the church where someone told me what Jesus had done and how I could be saved. And so I committed my life to Christ. If you want to do that this morning, I pray that you do. Just cry out, God save me. I believe that your son's death on the cross, that's what saved me. That's the only, that's the only thing. For the rest of us, where do you need to respond this morning? So, so many things. Has there been something in your life, some kind of, of, of conduct issue that is not in line with the gospel? God, I just pray through the power of your Holy Spirit that you will change and transform lives whatever it is, because I know that you can do it. I've seen it in my life. God, perhaps we haven't been as caring as we should to others. I just pray for opportunities for people to, uh, to be a part of relationships where that's possible, to show people, tell people about Jesus. I remember, you know, the story of Peter God spoke to Peter. He directed him to Cornelius. God spoke to Cornelius, directed him to Peter. Through the power of his Holy Spirit, that man's life was transformed. God brought them together. I don't care where you are, where you've been, God can change you. I pray for opportunities in those relationships for you to show your care and concern and see God work miracles. God, perhaps we've made it confusing. I just pray for clarity. There's a world out there that's separated from you and just pray for opportunities to uh, share that good news, see that you continue to change lives as we come together and give you the glory. In Jesus' name, amen.